So um, Dr. Leibold has talked a great deal about Dr. Corbin's work. And our first speaker of the afternoon is Audiological Assessment of Children with Unilateral Hearing Loss from Laboratory to Clinical Measures. And Nicole Corbin will be presenting. All right, I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> the first thing I wanna say is that I have changed my slides, so I apologize, because I know they're different in the book. Uh, the other thing I wanna say is thank you for bringing us out here. This has been great so far, and it's an honor to participate in this, and I think we're all really enjoying it. And so I am gonna be talking about the audiologic assessment of children with unilateral hearing loss. And I first need to acknowledge my collaborators and funding, so, well, mainly my advisors, so doctors Leibold and Buss, and then also we are funded through the National Institutes of Health. And the work I'll be talking about today was conducted at UNC, but as Dr. Leibold mentioned, we have a collaborative effort between both institutions now. So the goal of hearing, hear, early hearing detection and intervention, or EDI programs, has been to screen babies for hearing loss by one month of age, complete a diagnostic evaluation for those babies who do not pass the hearing screening by one month of age, or excuse me, three months of age, and then for those babies who are diagnosed with hearing loss, ultimately provide early intervention services through amplification and other means by six months of age. And for children with bilateral hearing loss, these programs have really allowed us to close the gap between the age of identification and intervention um, for, in, in general, for audiologic uh, outcomes. And then the correlation between early intervention and improved outcomes for children with bilateral hearing loss has really been well documented. So we've seen that in the literature and we can probably attest to that as clinicians and educators, parents in the room. Now, what about children with unilateral hearing loss? Where are we for in terms of EDI outcomes for them? So our EDI programs have allowed us to identify these children with hearing loss at an earlier age. So while the majority have traditionally been identified at school entry, so around five or six years of age, the median age of identification has now been decreased to within the first year of life, which is great. However, we have this persistent intervention um, delay for children who have unilateral hearing loss, and there are a lot of reasons for this, as we've touched on a little bit already this morning. And this is partly due to the lack of a correlation between improved outcomes for these children and early intervention. And so this is contributing to uncertainty on the part of clinicians, parents, service providers in general, regarding what to do with children who have unilateral hearing loss when they're identified at birth. Now, why do we have this delay? Well, in 2007, there was a survey of audiologists at large pediatric facilities, and it found that a third of them did not feel comfortable fitting amplification to a child with unilateral hearing loss just based on ABR results. Now, we know that we use ABR results and we're comfortable at this point fitting bilateral amplification to a child who has bilateral sensory neural hearing loss, yet we're not really there yet for children who have unilateral hearing loss. More recently, in 2014, Fitzpatrick and colleagues reported that only 20% of early identified children um, were initially recommended amplification. So we've got this huge discrepancy here in what we're doing with children who have unilateral hearing loss and children who have bilateral hearing loss. Now, apart from a lack of correlation between early fitting of amplification and outcomes for children who have unilateral hearing loss, or UHL, um, clinicians have expressed the concern regarding initial fitting because they want additional diagnostic information. And a lot of times they will like to wait until a behavioral test can be done at around six months developmental age. Furthermore, in the literature, we've seen that clinicians and providers have um, identified that since the signal to noise ratio or the SNR, SNR um, for infants prior to six months of age is generally pretty good since they're in their they're in close proximity to their caregivers, um, we, we're kind of just taking a conservative approach that they'll be able to acquire speech and language normally. And for many children, that is the case. Um, so 
What do we do? Well, we've taken a conservative approach to the management of unilateral hearing loss, and it's often characterized by a period of watch and wait. And so we might, you know, just kind of place the child on an audiologic monitoring protocol, um, provide some information about how to give the child the best access to speech, language, um, create a nice listening environment. There are some states in which children who have unilateral hearing loss will not qualify for early intervention services, unfortunately. Um, and so we just try to really monitor these children. And for some children, this is okay. So they do really well. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so we're, you know, they're fine. But when they're placed in more difficult listening environments, such as a classroom where we've got a lot of different noise sources, they might experience some subtle issues, fatigue, frustrations, even academic difficulties. Dr. Liu has reported on her cohort of children, um, and we've got some really great information about that. And so some of those children don't do very well, and we often intervene at the point of failure for them. So we've been monitoring them, we're doing our pure tone audiograms yearly, and we don't really identify a deficit in the clinic, but once they're placed in these more demanding listening environments, we, um, we find out that they're not doing so well. So we're really looking for a test that's sensitive to which children are not doing well. So this is a case uh, that illustrates a problem that we have. Uh, so this is a case that I saw in my externship. And here we have an audiogram, which most of you are familiar with. So on the audiogram, we're plotting hearing level in decibels as a function of the different frequencies. So we have low pitches down here, high pitches over here. We're looking at how loud, so as we go down, um, oh, excuse me, the, oh, here it is, the down, the y-axis, sounds are getting louder. So we present sounds at each of these different pitches, and we measure how loud does that sound need to be for the child to detect it 50% of the time. And we have X's to represent these levels or thresholds in the left ear. And then we have these triangles to represent the thresholds in the right ear. Anything that falls above this orange line is considered in the normal range. So we, here we have normal hearing in the left ear, we have a hearing loss in the right ear. And this is for a six-year-old female that I saw during my externship. And she had been getting her audiologic monitoring yearly. She'd been identified at birth with this hearing loss, but was not fit with amplification at the time. And parents reported that she was using an FM system in the classroom and um, that she was doing fine. However, she was starting to have difficulties in these areas that were diagnosed by speech and language um, and different interventionists. Uh, personnel. So she's having difficulties with phonological processing, reading, memory and recall, and attention. And some of these areas, we have noticed that some children with unilateral hearing loss have these difficulties. Now we can't really say that the hearing loss is causing this, but as a clinician, what do you do? So you've had a child that's been having essentially monaural input um, or reduced binaural input for six years. Are you going to fit a hearing aid at this time? Um, we don't know, we really don't know. And I think that in the first half of today's symposium, we kind of found that out. We don't know what to do at this point. So um, we, this is kind of what I did. <laughs> I don't know what to do here. And this is what really drove me to this area of research. So hopefully we'll kind of be able to tease apart some of these problems. But really what we're finding is that we have substantial variability in outcomes for these children, as Dr. Liu has alluded to. And we don't know what contributes to this variability. So it's, it's hard to solve a problem when you don't really have the answer yet, um, obviously. So we've got a lack of evidence regarding which children have the greatest need for intervention, when during development that intervention should begin, should it begin at birth, should it be a monitoring, and then also what intervention is optimal. And if we can identify these three factors, I think we can really hit the target with these children, at least for some of them. So that's kind of where we're moving towards establishing more evidence and through rigorous research um, that we have been talking about today. So where I find the greatest clinical need and what drives my interest is trying to find an auditory assessment or developing one, adapting one, that's sensitive to real world outcomes for these children. So we can eventually predict 
which children prior to the point of failure are going to fail, which children are at risk for these difficulties. So if we identify factors on an auditory assessment, maybe we can improve counseling and rehabilitation options for pediatric unilateral hearing loss. So if we want to develop a clinical measurement, we need to figure out, well, what are we currently doing? Um, we have our traditional audiologic assessments that we use in the clinic. And for pediatrics, those might involve physiologic assessments. So examples would be the auditory brainstem response, or ABR. That's the one that's done at birth. Um, helps us estimate hearing sensitivity. The otoacoustic emissions, or OAEs, are also going to help us estimate how the cochlea is um, doing. And then our emittance battery, or for instance, a tympanogram, which will give us information about the middle ear health. We also have behavioral assessments that we can perform after a developmental age of four to six um, months. We are looking at pure tone thresholds, so what I just showed before, how soft or how loud is the sound at each of those pitches for them to hear it 50% of the time. We have a speech recognition threshold, or the SRT, which is going to tell us how loud a speech sim signal or how soft a speech signal can be for the child to repeat back a word. So they might say baseball, hot dog, airplane, and we're varying the level at which they repeat that back correctly. And then we also have speech recognition scores, which are measuring the proportion or the percentage of a speech stimulus, whether that's words or sentences, that a child can understand or repeat back correctly when it's audible. So it's above their thresholds for hearing, and we know that they're getting that s signal. So these are really helping us understand the hearing loss. However, they're all done in quiet. And we know that we don't live in a quiet environment. As Dr. Leibel discussed, there's a lot of different sound sources in children's environments. So what are we doing that's going to help us predict how these children are doing outside the confines of the sound booth, where it's very, very soft? So. We know children live in complex environments. We've got lots of different sound sources. Um, and there's different types of masking that is going to occur, so that interference. So Dr. Leibold talked about how there is some masking or interference that occurs at the level of the cochlea due to overlap of the signals. There's also masking that's going to occur higher up in the auditory system, where a child or a listener might have difficulty figuring out where target speech is coming from and being able to separate it from competing speech, for instance. So do we have a clinical assessment that gets at these children's performance in these types of complex listening environments? Well, we can look at our not-so-traditional assessments um, that are sometimes included. I know that here at the Children's Hospital, they do include a lot of these, so that's awesome. But that's not the case everywhere across the nation, unfortunately. So we've got our functional outcome measures, which take the form of questionnaires. And they're really going to help us identify and monitor children's listening abilities and behaviors in the real world. So this might involve a self-assessment, um, such as the one that Dr. Liu described. She developed the HearQL, or a parent or teacher assessment that's going to help us identify listening situations that the child's not performing well in. Um, an example of such an outcome measure is the PEACH, or the Parents' Evaluation of Aural Oral Performance of Children. And just an example of a question here, how often does your child understand what you say in a car? And so the, the parent would circle zero to four to represent never, um, seldom, sometimes, often, or always they understand me. And then we can calculate the score and determine what type of listening challenges the child is having. A lot of these tools are used as screening measures, but they can provide really helpful information for how the child is doing um, in the real world. And there's a lot of different types of measures that are out there. So they just might give us a little bit more information about how the child is doing. Another not so traditional clinical assessment that can be included in the battery looks at speech perception and the presence of competing background sounds. So as Dr. Leibel discussed, we can measure how well a child can understand a speech stimulus when there's a steady state noise in the background 
or competing speech in the background. And those types of assessments are gonna provide different types of, of masking and also information about how the child is performing. Um, these are often using presenting target speech. So for instance, my voice from the front of the child. And then the competition is also coming from the front of the child. And as Dr. Leibel discussed, we know that oftentimes those stimuli are separate in space in their natural environments. So I might be talking to someone, but there's gonna be different types and sources of competing noise that are gonna be spatially separated in the environment. So it's, it's getting closer to understanding how someone is doing in the real world, but it's not quite there yet because we're not assessing all these different types of competing sounds coming from different areas and space. These are often using steady noise, so that windy noise that kind of sounds like a sound, or a babble. And what we mean by babble is multiple people talking, so it could be a recording of eight people talking in the background. And um, that's, that's definitely helping us getting to understand how children are performing in these environments. However, we know that um, there's also a lot of information that can be gleaned when we have a competing stimulus coming from a different place in our space with maybe even two people talking. So like the demonstrations that Lord, Dr. Leibold discussed. So we don't really have a clinical tool right now that's really helping us narrow down which children are struggling in their environments. So is there a tool in the lab that we can modify for use in the clinic and that might help us identify prior to the point of failure which children need more aggressive intervention? So what do we do in the laboratory setting? Well, one of the things that I just alluded to, a limitation of our current assessments, is that we're often measuring performance when the target speech and the masker speech or a masker stimulus is coming from the front of the listener. They're not spatially separated in the environment. And we know in natural environments, that's not typically the case. So in the lab, how do we me measure spatial hearing is what we call it. We typically have a listener sitting here facing a a, an array of speakers here. Um, we can present a target speech stimulus from the front, and then we can present competing stimuli from all around the listener. It might be coming from all of these different speakers or just a few. So that will help us get information about how a child is performing in that environment. And certainly these types of measures have shown deficits for children who have unilateral hearing loss. That's largely due, we're assuming, to the lack of use of optimal spatial cues that Dr. Leibold discussed this morning. So we would expect that that might be a more difficult listening environment for a child with unilateral hearing loss. So can we use something like this in the clinic? Well, this is what it looks like. So I don't know about the booths here, but at UNC our audiology booths are not this big. And this type of setup um, is, is a little bit difficult and it's pretty time consuming to get a lot of information here. So this might not be the most feasible thing for use in the clinic. What about an assessment where we can use maybe two different loudspeakers? So another setup that we've used in the laboratory, um, it's a little bit simpler and it requires only the use of two speakers, is presenting noise and speech from different speakers for a listener who has unilateral hearing loss and looking at their performance. So as I think Dr. Leibel showed before, um, this orange here represents a, the ear with the hearing loss. So we might have a listener facing the front, speech being presented to the normal hearing ear, noise being presented to the ear with hearing loss, and we might measure performance there. And we would expect that because the noise is going to that ear with poor hearing, the speech stimulus is going to the ear with normal hearing, that would be the most beneficial listening environment. And that's typically what we recommend for seating um, in the classroom even. We might also then compare performance when this is flip-flopped. So the noise is now to the better hearing ear and the speech is presented to the ear with hearing loss. And we would expect the performance to deteriorate. And we do see that in children who have unilateral hearing loss on these laboratory measurements. So perhaps this is something that we can start using in the clinic. And I think that you guys here actually do something similar to this, which is excellent. So is this something we can use? Well, I think it is. A, a lot of sound booths already have two speakers in the testing environment. And this is actually the environment or the setup that we're using at UNC to perform the experiments that I'll be 
talking a little bit about today. All right, so we have kind of figured out what we can do for spatial hearing assessment for these children. But another limitation that I mentioned was that these competing background sounds that we use right now are relatively steady state. So they're not assessing the most difficult listening situation a child could be in. And so what, what in the laboratory do we use to measure complex speech perception? So where there's a lot of that informational masking that Dr. Leibel discussed, as opposed to so much of the auditory um, overlap at the auditory periphery, that energetic masking caused by that relatively steady state noise. So we can look to experiments that have been done in our laboratory um, to get some information about this. This is a Leibel at all 2013, so it was uh, two years ago that this was published, and it looked at speech recognition and complex speech maskers for children with bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. So there were listeners, that, children 9 to 17 years of age, who were all wearing amplification, and then they, we had age-matched peers with normal hearing complete this study. The procedure was a word identification task, and what that means is that the stimulus, for instance, my voice, is saying a word, one of these words specifically um, on this example here. So for instance, cupcake. Now the tricky, and the child would click on the picture of the uh, word that they heard. So if I heard cupcake, I would click on cupcake and the test would continue. Now there were two different types of masking going on in these uh, experiments. One was steady noise, the one that just kind of the relatively shh type of noise. The other one was the two talker speech that we discussed before, which is a very difficult listening condition, and it's assessing more of some higher order complex uh, auditory skills. So again, this is a, a typical setup for this experiment. We've got a picture board, there's four pictures. You might hear the word cupcake. There's either the steady state noise or the two talker speech masker in the background, and the child is clicking on the, word, the picture of the word that they heard. Now, we're adjusting the level of the background noise up and down to find out the signal to noise ratio, so how loud the target speech or the word needs to be above the competing noise in order for the child to get 70% correct on this task. And what we find is pretty interesting. So here we've got two listening conditions down here. We've got speech shape noise and the two talker speech. These are our average results. The children with hearing loss are represented by the shaded in symbols, and then the children with normal hearing are represented by the open squares. On the y-axis, we have signal to noise ratio in decibels. So as you go down the y-axis, that's better performance because the listener can, can <laughs> use a less advantageous signal to noise ratio to still get that 70% correct criterion performance. And we're, so we're looking at the signal to noise ratio um, at which the child can achieve that 70% correct as a function of each masker condition. And the first thing I'll say is that the listeners with hearing loss, there wasn't an effective age. So we've got children nine to 17 years of age represented by um, these two symbols. And those are the children with bilateral hearing loss. And you can tell also that these children required a greater signal to noise ratio than their peers with normal hearing to achieve the same level of performance in both maskers. So for both masking conditions, children who have bilateral hearing loss needed the signal to be higher than the noise, even more so than the children with normal hearing, which we would expect. The next thing that we can see is that in the speech shape noise masker, so that relatively steady state masker, the difference in performance between the children with hearing loss and the children with normal hearing is 3.5 decibels signal to noise ratio. So they're needing, the children with hearing loss are needing it three and a half decibels higher than the children with normal hearing to achieve the same level of performance in the speech shape noise. In the two talker speech, that difference becomes greater, eight, eight dB, and that's huge. Um, so we're clearly capturing some more complex listening skills and showing that these children with bilateral hearing loss need that signal to be much greater than the children with normal hearing when it's a really difficult listening condition involving that informational masking that Dr. Leibold talked about. And that's a huge benefit. 
So it's just a big, big, big deal. All right, so we want to measure this complex speech perception. We know children with bilateral sensory neural hearing loss, even when they're using their hearing aids, need a greater signal to noise ratio than their normal hearing counterparts in those really difficult listening conditions. And across, even across age, the children are gonna need that higher signal to noise ratio. That's just what I was telling you. All right, so we're wondering, so we, if we think that this is capturing performance in the complex listening environments, but how do we really know that? So we did a follow-up study and we wanted to see if that performance in the laboratory measure that I just presented corresponded to parents' performance of how, excuse me, parents' evaluation of their children's performance in complex listening environments. So the follow-up study, um, we had parents complete, parents of the children with hearing loss that had just completed that study, completed the abbreviated profile of hearing aid benefit, and 10 of the 17 questionnaires that we mailed out to the parents were returned. And we wanted to see if the scores obtained on that outcome measure, so a questionnaire would correlate or have an, any kind of association with their performance in either the speech-shaped noise or the two-talker speech on that word identification task. And an example of a question for this uh, questionnaire was, my child's teacher reported he or she misses a lot of information in the classroom. The parent would rate that from always to never. And so those types of questions are, are completed and we calculate a score. So what did we find? Well, we found a significant relationship between this questionnaire and lab performance in that two talker speech masker, but not the speech shape noise masker that we typically use um, in the clinic even. So here we're looking at the ease of communication subscale um, and then the percentage of problems that the parent is reporting their child has on this scale. So in the two talker speech masker and the speech shape noise masker, as you move down the y-axis here, there's less problems reported, so that's a better score. As you move down to the left on the x-axis, this is a greater, a better performance. So this is that signal to noise ratio that we were looking at before, require, the children required to get the performance either in the two talker speech or the noise masker. And so a child that can tolerate a negative signal to noise ratio here, for instance, um, can tolerate more noise and still do pretty well on the task. And then a child that's falling down here on the Y axis is having less percentage of problems reported by their parents. So we see that we have a nice correlation here or a nice association between the two measures um, and how the child is performing in the two talker speech masker. We're not getting that same relationship in the noise masker. So this is really important because it's showing us that we're actually tapping into something different and something useful when we're looking at a performance in the two talker masker. With the speech shaped noise, not as much. And that's really telling because we're, this is what we're using in the clinic. We're also using maskers such as um, multi talker babbles that have a similar similar spectrum or similar shape of the waveform as the noise. So this is really important. All right, so we can conclude from those studies that um, current clinical assessments might be underestimating difficulties for some children with bilateral hearing loss that they're experiencing in their everyday environments. We also can maybe start to think that if we are looking at speech perception in the presence of a small number of competing talkers, so that two talker speech, for instance, we might be able to really kind of start looking at performance in everyday life. So we're, we might be able to get more of a valid measure of performance. Additionally, these subjective questionnaires or these outcome measures, the AFAB, um, different type of questionnaires might be providing some information that we're not currently really tapping into. So this is really important for us moving forward in the clinical field. So perhaps for these children with unilateral hearing loss, we could maybe take a laboratory measurement, so using that assessing performance in a spatial hearing um, type of situation. So for instance, with the two loudspeakers, that type of environment, 
And then performance in that complex speech perception task. So using a two talker masker, would that help us provide some information about how these children are actually performing in their everyday environments? And will it help us to maybe someday predict which children are at risk for failure? So perhaps a child who does worse in that type of measure might also be the one that's struggling in the classroom. So my first pass at getting to a clinical measure like this is what I am going to now present. So the purpose of my pre-dissertation project was to look at the extent to which a simulated unilateral hearing loss affected children's abilities to benefit from spatial cues, to accurately perceive speech in these complex listening environments where we have a two-talker speech masker in the background. And I started with the simulated hearing loss because I wanted to see what the results were there and then hopefully extend this type of testing to children who have actual unilateral hearing loss. So we had 12 children, small study, um, eight to 10 years of age, and we had 11 adults. Everyone had normal hearing bilaterally. And they, they completed a sentence recognition task. So what that involves is a sentence being presented. So you'll hear an example of one soon. And we're, me we're measuring um, how loud the target speech, so that sentence is, above or below the competing masker in order for the child to get 50% of correct of the target words. So for instance, the example you'll hear is the rain came down. And so does the child repeat all those words correctly? Does the child repeat two of the words correctly? And so we're tracking performance in that, in that uh, condition. And we're using BKB sentences, which are already used in the clinic um, to assess speech perception and noise. However, in their clinical form right now, they're assessing speech perception, uh, I believe, in a, the presence of a multi-talker babble. The masker stimuli that we used for this experiment was either speech-shaped noise, which sounds like this, maybe. So that relatively steady state masker or the two talker speech. Here Welcome comes Caroline, 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 So we can tell that that two talker speech is gonna be a lot more difficult to really understand the target speech being presented. So this is again our procedure. So we've got a child facing our loudspeakers here. We have one speaker coming from the front and then we have a masker stimulus which will come from the side and then the child will complete this experiment um, in both maskers and then also with the, the, the uh, masker stimulus coming from either side and I'll go more into detail of that. But this is an example of what the child might hear. So the time, he just stood the rain came down and a little bit of that. So the stimulus was the rain came down. And so we're varying the level of the masker and the target speech to find that signal to noise ratio at which the child can detect 50% of the words in those sentences. We first assess condition, or actually it was randomized, but one of the conditions that we assess is when the, the target speech is coming from the front of the listener. So this is the nose. I don't have any ears on here. And the target, the two talker speech masker is coming from the front as well. We call that the co-located condition. We assess this in um, the condition which adults and children have access to both normal hearing ears. So they're listening binaurally. We then, so the results that we obtained here, um, we've got threshold and dB signal to noise ratio. So how soft um, does that speech stimulus relative to the noise, how soft can it be um, in order for the child to achieve that 50% correct speech recognition? And we've got um, adult data is represented by the X, and then the children are represented by the circle. And you can see here that the signal to noise ratio, it's around zero for both the children and adults when you have the target speech and the masker speech both coming from the front of the listener. And there's not a huge difference between the children and adults here, um, which, is, which is interesting in and of itself, but yes. All right, so then we, again, better performance is indicated by data falling lower down on this Y axis. We then present the stimuli so that the, the target sentences are coming from the front of the listener. And then we spatially separate 
the masker to one side of the listener. And so in this situation, we're helping the listener separate which is the target speech and which is the masker speech. And so we expect that their performance will improve because we're helping them do that. In this condition where they're, they're both coming from the front, it's more difficult because they need to do that all by themselves. So we expect performance to get better in this condition. And again, the listener has access to both normal hearing ears in this setup. So now we can look at performance. So this is what I just presented for when the target and the mask or stimulus are both coming from the front of the listener. And here are the thresholds when we spatially separate the target and the masker. So again, our children are represented by the circle and then the adults are in the X. And you can see that, that there's this huge improvement in performance when we spatially separate the target and the mask or stimuli. And the, the listener has access to both ears in this situation. And we know that binaural hearing is really important for them to be able to do this task. So we would expect this, okay? So now we simulated a unilateral hearing loss. So the way that we did that was through the use of an earplug and an earmuff over one of the ears. And it provided an average hearing loss, granted conductive, um, of about of a moderate degree. Okay, so it was about a moderate unilateral hearing loss that we simulated. And then we measured performance again. So this is, kind of what it looks like the setup and here you can see that the speaker is going to be directed towards the normal hearing ear in some cases and then the speaker will be directed towards the ear with the simulation um, in other conditions so we've got our simulation here our unilateral hearing loss in indicated by the orange circle and we do our target sentences from the front and then we also do our mask or stimulus from the front. And we look at, is there a difference in performance when the, the child or the adult has a simulated unilateral hearing loss relative to when they had access to both of their normal hearing ears? So here is that same res results again. Here we've got our open condition. So you've already seen these results. And this is the, these are the results that we obtained for the plug condition. Again, the children are the circle, the adults are the X. And you can see that in this situation where the target speech and the master speech are both coming from the front, there's not a huge difference in performance. And this is pretty much what we expect and it's consistent with what's found in the literature. And if you think back to Dr. Leibold's talk, when you have a stimulus coming from the front of a listener, it's gonna hit the ears at similar intes intensity and the same time. So there's not really a huge difference between the ears and what, this, what the signal that's getting there. You would expect that with two ears, it might be better because of that redundancy that she was talking about. But again, as she mentioned, the, that summation or that redundancy effect, the benefit of having two ears is on the order of a couple dB. So we're not gonna see a huge difference in performance here. We then do our spatial separation. So we have our target speech coming from the front, and then we spatially separate our masker to the side of the ear with the simulated hearing loss. In this condition, so again, we have our data that I've already presented here, and then now we've got data looking at what's the threshold in dB signal to noise ratio when we plug, the plug one ear and we present the masker to the ear with the hearing loss. So if you recall, when the masker is gonna be on the side of the hearing loss and the target speech is either in the front or on the side of the normal hearing ear, the listener is probably gonna do okay in that situation. This, these data would suggest not as well as we might think. So if you take a look at the listener when they have a simulated hearing loss, so plugged, these data here, and then you go down here, we can we can see that they improve their performance because they're, we have provided a spatial, a binaural cue, so we've spatially separated the target and the masker, but it's not, they're not as able to take advantage of that cue as great, as well as they would if they had access to both normal hearing ears. So there's a performance difference. There's an effect of having a unilateral hearing loss when you have target and masker spatially separated and the masker is on the side of the ear with the hearing loss. So that's pretty important because we typically advise that if a child has a unilateral hearing loss, we'll face them in the classroom so that they have the normal hearing ear 
near the target speech or the teacher, for instance, and the ear with the hearing loss on the side of the mask or stimulus, so competing talkers or the, the um, HVAC, so heating, ventilation, air conditioning system. And they should do as, just as well as they would if they had two normal hearing ears, but that's not the case. Oops. All right. So then we do our target sentences from the front, and we spatially separate our masker to the side of the normal hearing ear, and we would assume that the, the listener would not do as well in this condition. And that's what we see as well. So we see they require a greater signal to noise ratio in that condition where we've provided a cue of spatial separation. So that binaural um, information, we're trying to help them in that situation. And they're still not doing as well as they would if they had two normal hearing ears. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So I, if you recall, I also um, did this in the speech shape noise masker. And so these are the same data, but just for the children. So we've got all children here. We've got our speech masker represented by the open circles, our noise masker represented by the filled circles. Again, threshold and dB signal to noise ratio. So we have better performance if the symbols are falling lower on the graph. And you can see that the child does better in that noise masker but they're not doing as well. The, there's a huge gap in performance when we have our two talker speech masker. So that more difficult listening situation really is more difficult when you have altered access to your binaural hearing. So perhaps this is something that we can use to test children who actually have unilateral hearing loss. All right, so what can we conclude from this? Well, ass assessment of spatial hearing in that two talker masker might reveal performance differences that we haven't been capturing with steady state noise. Now, this was a simulation. It was a moderate hearing loss. And so you can imagine, I wonder what would happen for a child in this condition if they've had longstanding unilateral hearing loss of differing degrees. The results are likely going to be different. And we are going to be extending this test to children who have permanent unilateral hearing loss. We're also going to look at incorporating functional outcome measures, so a questionnaire such as the HearQL, to see if there's a relationship between performance on our lab measurement and performance as assessed by the child or the parent. We would like to eventually, one of my goals is to develop a protocol that will be useful in the clinic and help us identify prior to the point of failure which children we need to be more aggressive in our management with. And then maybe this kind of two talker speech masker assessment, maybe this can be used as a pre and post intervention measurement to see if we really are having a benefit of a cross and FM, something like that. So that's where we're hoping to go. And my hope is that we take this problem that we've had. So the six year old child that comes in hasn't had any amplification, has used an FM system, isn't doing well now in the school when she starts school, maybe we can have a solution and maybe this is our solution, is assessing real world performance and trying to ad adapt a laboratory measure so it can be used in the clinic and we can actually assess um, how they're doing in the real world and help make a difference in their lives. And hopefully we'll be on the road to changes. So. Any questions? <clears throat> um, do you have any data on what age you are seeing these kids at the point of failure? Is it when they start school? Is it in later years? When are you seeing the point of failure? That's a good question. I'm not sure that we have, I know that they, they will typically come in, we've identified them a lot of times at school age when they are in more complex environments, but I'm not sure that we have data on that. Dr. Liu, do you know? Okay. 
so they're not so much failing as they're having difficulty, and it's kind of an ongoing struggle. Um, and so, for instance, in the, the child that you um, saw as an extern, um, one of the very first children that uh, our group amplified was a little girl who was about six or seven, um, had um, a lot of risk factors for having difficulty, um, such as um, prematurity and kind of ongoing cognitive issues, but, and she just had a mild unilateral hearing loss, sensory neural. Um, and because she was having so much difficulty in school, we just went ahead and amplified her. And many of the issues that she had, they didn't disappear, but they certainly got much easier to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's that ease of listening that um, even if she is older, um, she still had some auditory input. Um, I think it just makes things a lot simpler um, for them to hear. And if they have benefit to this added signal to noise ratio, it just makes it much easier. Um, the other thing is that I would say is, uh, along with the failure, it's it's not again failure. It's just yeah struggle. Yeah, struggle. That's what I mean by that. It's not an academic failure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, so I just want to clarify one thing because um, <laughs> uh, one of the practices that we do in a classroom with a student is suggest that they sit with their better ear to the teacher. Your results seem to show the opposite of that, and it frightened me a little bit. So can we clarify that? <laughs> Well, that um, I think that that's probably going to give them the greatest signal to noise ratio. And these are essentially preliminary data, a small subset of children. They have normal hearing. We're simulating a hearing loss. So it's something that's interesting that we're, we're going to investigate further. But I wouldn't change clinical practice at this point based on that. Um, yeah, but just being aware that these children might still be having subtle difficulties even though we're providing them preferential seat me, seating right. and things like that. Yeah, yeah just being huge. aware. With many of our students, yeah. is preferential seating all the way. You yep. know? And, so, and that might not be giving them yeah. the greatest access to the information they need. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking that. Am I okay? <laughs> In the front. Oh, Up here. Up here? Just oh, quick. Hi. Hi. Comment. Um, Something that occurs to me too when we uh, observe kids in the classroom and we provide preferential seating. Preferential seating, as I think all of us can agree, is very fluid. Mm -hmm. And you know, the signal of interest is, is most commonly the teacher, but when we have a child sitting at a group with five peers, we need for him or her to hear peers as well. <laughs> So, yeah, um, and I think most people are aware of that, but but m maybe not everybody. So I usually want to make a comment about, you know, where is the signal of Primary. interest? <laughs> yeah, no, that's an um, excellent point. And, Thank and you. for people to be aware that peer comment is is very important as mm -hmm. well, and overhearing, which which our kids miss all of the time, mm -hmm. um, and so especially in group situations, I think that's really important to consider. I would agree. Yeah. Thank you. I'm thinking of a couple different things here. One being, right, I don't want to wait until the child is at the point of failure for intervention. <laughs> I want to be more proactive. I want to get ahead of the game and help as much as possible. But I also want the child to have options. Maybe there's mm -hmm. an interpreter. Maybe there's cart services for captioning. Perhaps there are things that we could do before it becomes an issue for the child. Because it's going to affect their self-esteem as well as their performance academically. That's an excellent point. And I think that hits on uh, the job of an audiologist is really providing um, the best, the best <laughs> knowledge you know about what to do um, in these cases and providing options. I think that's huge. And that's a huge you know, empowering the family and the child to make those decisions with the best evidence that we have. And I think as we continue with research, we'll be able to kind of hone in on those things, um, what what factors are going to be most important for all those children. And I think providing all access that you can through those types of services, that's an excellent, excellent point. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, up here. Hi. So uh, I guess, I guess what I just felt like reinforcing was what 
and sort of clarifying was that what you were saying was your research isn't showing that preferential seating is not necessarily a good thing. You're just saying that they're still not going to be as at at the advantage of a normal hearing student, Correct. even with the preferential seating. For some children. So you still need the preferential yes. seating. Yes, <laughs> yes. So basically, any time that we see a student with unilateral hearing loss, they have it. Yes. <laughs> they should be preferentially seated. And preferential seating means with good access to peers, access not to sitting peers, right in front yeah. of the um, Elmo. Elmo. <laughs> whatever you call that thing. Yeah. And focus. Um, you know, taking in, you know, where the good lighting is and mm -hmm. all that. Lighting is another issue. So, yeah. Um, so, so if, if you give them the accommodations, they're still at a disadvantage. Unfortunately, they're still they sh some but of them. What, yeah. You know, so they're at risk. They're at risk from day one. Once we know they have that, you know, lateral yes. hearing loss. Yes. So Thank we just you. need to all keep that in mind. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. One of the issues that we deal with in the schools is, besides the preferential seating which we give them, it may not be adequate for them mm -hmm. to give them equal access to their peers. And one of the things that we have to deal with in schools is unfortunately the regulations that kind of look at a child that who is failing before we can implement any like individualized services. Right. So we're looking more and more at accommodation plans through 504. Um, and looking more and more at doing the preferential seating, the amplification, and hoping that that will help too. But yeah, we're, our hands are kind of tied when the child still performs within the norms, um, yet we know they're struggling a little bit, but our hands are tied to do something. Yeah, and that's why I, my goal is to find an auditory assessment that will identify those subtle difficulties that we're not showing to right now. And then maybe that can help advance. Yeah. Hi. 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 I love your data, by the way. It's Thank great. You. Um, I'm just curious, because I think you're kind of at the same point as we are of thinking of these ways to assess kids, but they have to be able to do speech perception yeah. measures, mm -hmm. and that's often sentences. And so do you just have any inklings about what you might do with younger kids? <laughs> we <laughs> actually um, are looking into adapting our observer-based method of okay. testing older, or testing infants and toddlers, um, and looking at how we can implement that in a spatial paradigm as well. And we are just starting to have conversations about how we can best do that in our lab. Um, so in clinic right now, I don't have a good answer, but that's kind of, I think that once we start maybe with children at school age that can provide us this information, we can get towards an assessment for younger children who aren't able to provide that information. So I know that this study was um, mostly using children with simulated um, hearing Com loss. Completely, yes. Um, do you think that there may be a difference between the simulating, simu simulated hearing loss and the children who actually have a hearing loss that maybe uh, there are differences between their cognition? Maybe the children that actually have hearing loss um, have done, have had strategies to mm -hmm. help, um, you know, their self. Yep. as opposed to the children who are just kind of faking it, right? Acute, yeah. No, absolutely. And that is that is something that um, we're excited to see what the if there is a performance difference. I would assume that there would be because of what you just said. They've had time to kind of figure out how to do mm -hmm. this. And so maybe there won't be a huge, um, it won't, I think regardless that this type of assessment will identify some subtle things that we aren't capturing clearly. But I do think that the, there will be a difference in the data for sure, yeah. Do you think there will be um, future studies that will see um, the, difference with the differences uh, and will capture the children who um, have the actual hearing loss so that there may be a subtle difference between that and the simulated hearing loss? I, well, my dissertation will hopefully do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then hopefully we will continue to, to conduct more studies in this area, so I Thank do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Nicole, did you say you randomized the order in which the different conditions were presented? Yes. And so can you, did you control for a practice effect in, yeah. in this state? Yes. Yeah. And so um, some children, half of the, well, even in the adults, half participated first with the plug in, half did it without the plug, and then we randomized the conditions. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I'm curious, too, in your data, how many children did you have, just, just in, the, in general, in the United States, how many children have unilateral hearing loss? The prevalence, it's hard to estimate the prevalence right now, but I think it's <laughs> as high as 6% has been recently reported in 2010. I think it was 2010. Thank you. Thank you.